Good day. Today, 3rd December, the conflict in Ukraine continues and also, of course, the conflict in Gaza. I will return to Gaza later in this program. I'm going to discuss, firstly, the situation in Ukraine, where there have been many rumours, much discussion and increasing signs that the West in particular is starting to despair of the outcome. First uh, thing to say is that we've now had perhaps the most pessimistic statement about the state of the war from uh, Jens Stoltenberg, NATO Secretary General, a pronounced hardliner, a person who, in my opinion, um, has played an absolutely critical role in making the um, war happen in the first place, and who also played a critical role in pre preventing negotiations from taking place. Anyway, um, these are some of the things that Stoltenberg is reported to have said. He said we should all we should be prepared for bad news. Wars develop in phrase in phases, but we have to support Ukraine in both good and bad times. So he says that the situation is bad. And he, in fact, went further and said that Ukraine is now in a critical situation. But he gave no advice. He gave no suggestions, political suggestions, about how the situation could be changed or turned round. He said instead that he would leave it to Ukrainians to uh, and military commanders to make these difficult operational decisions. And as for the West, his advice again was to boost ammunition production. One of the issues we should address is the fragmentation of the European defence industry, which is we're now almost approaching the second year of the war. And Stoltenberg has finally discovered that the Russians are out producing the West in weaponry and ammunition, and he's becoming concerned about this, or so he tells us, even though people like Alex Vashinin, Brian Baletic, ourselves at the Durand, myself on this channel, lots of others have been talking about this for, well, <laughs> years now. But anyway, um, Stoltenberg has just discovered that there are problems with Europe's uh, defence industries, that the West is unable to keep up with the Ru Russian production, industrial production surge. And um, even as he says that, as we see, he comes up with no real solutions, no proposals about what to do, about the way forward. Certainly, he's not talking about negotiations. He remains as rigidly op as opposed to those as he has always been, so far as I can see. But he tells us that we should prepare for bad news. Situation is critical, going from bad to worse. And, you know, nonetheless, we must cling on and go on doing more of what we have been doing. As there's that famous phrase, that famous comment that was made, sometimes attributed wrongly as it happens to Einstein, do the same thing again and again and expect a different result and that being a sign of madness. Well, I'm not going to suggest that Mr. Stoltenberg is mad, but he does seem to be proposing that we just go on doing the same thing again and again and expect a different result. Anyway, moving on from Stoltenberg, there was on the topic of Western production of weapon systems, there was apparently in Germany a couple of days ago, there's a long article about this in the London Times, a meeting of senior German officers. Uh, they were addressed also there by um, a German military historian. They assessed the overall situation with NATO militaries and they pronounced them dire. They said that the state of 
NATO militaries has declined further since the war began because of these enormous transfers of material and equipment to Ukraine, um, that recruitment levels remain poor, that the military industries in Europe remain, as Stoltenberg said, fragmented. I suspect, by the way, he's now talking, he's, that comment that he made about the fragmentation of European industries, defence industries, largely comes off the back of this conference in, uh, in Germany. Anyway, that the state of Europe's defence industries remains dire. And they also said, and this is a fascinating revelation, apparently military people were saying this, that Europe, the European militaries, are in no condition to fight the Russian army. Should the Russians decide to advance into Europe, it would be a debacle on a similar scale to Napoleon's invasion of the Holy Roman Empire, Germany, in other words, um, in the late 19th, the late 18th, early 19th century, when all of these German states, these little German states with their chocolate box armies, all disintegrated in the face of Napoleon, one after the other. They all collapsed. And that, supposedly, is the state of Europe at the moment. But going back to Stoltenberg and people like him, it's not actually difficult to see how what he is proposing is only going to make the matter worse, because he's proposing that ammunition and weapons production in Europe be increased. Of course, he doesn't really discuss exactly how that is to be done. But anyway, that's what he says should happen. He wants ammunition and weapons production to be increased. But he doesn't apparently suggest that this equipment should be supplied to rebuild NATO militaries. He wants it all to be shipped again to Ukraine, presumably to prolong the war and to hope that something happens in Ukraine um, that somehow dramatically changes the course of that war, notwithstanding that we've had many comments now by Western officials, especially American officials, saying that realistically there are no weapon systems that the West can supply to Ukraine which can change the trajectory of the war there. Anyway, that's Stoltenberg. And we can see that when Stoltenberg is starting to talk in this way, we get the sense that things are going very bad indeed. And of course, he's telling us to prepare for the things to get worse still. And I'm going to suggest that this explains lots of things that are taking place in the political sphere. The poisonous infighting that's taking place in Kiev, for example. And now the mayor of Kiev, Vitaly Klitschko, has joined the fray. He's been giving interviews and he's talking about Zelensky, though he's careful not to name Zelensky himself. He's talking about Zelensky in scathing terms. He again says that Zelensky has no tactical judgments, that Ukraine is drifting into becoming an authoritarian state. He says, this is Klitschko speaking, that we're heading towards one-man rule. He criticizes Zelensky's um, approach, his actions at the start of the war. He says that, he says, this is Klitschko again, that when the war began in February and March 2022, the central government, in other words, Zelensky himself, far from providing a clear lead, they collapsed, they imploded into chaos. It was Ukraine's mayors and local officials that held everything together. I think that's unfair, by the way. But anyway, that's what Klitschko is saying now. And their reward 
for holding things together in that critical period of Fre February, March last year. Their reward for all of that is to be completely frozen out and ignored in the decision-making process. So all of the indications, again, from Ukraine of deepening political um, infighting there. Zelensky versus Zeluzhny. Um, Klitschko versus Zelensky. I should say that Klitschko, in some respects, has uh, a longer political pedigree and um, deeper political roots in Ukraine than um, Zelensky himself does. He is one of the two Klitschko brothers, the two boxers. Um, he was a major figure at the time of the Maidan protests in 2013, 2014. He appeared for a time, in fact, to be the leader of the Maidan protests, though that was never really true. And I remember that there was some talk at that time that if the Maidan protests succeeded, he might be the new president of, the, of Ukraine. And of course, if there'd been elections, it was widely assumed at the time, this was during the Maidan protests, that he would be the presidential candidate of the Maidan movement, and that it would he who would take over from uh, the then president, the one who was eventually overthrown, Viktor Yanukovych. Um, as it happens, the Americans didn't like or trust Klitschko. And there was that famous telephone conversation between um, Victoria Nuland and the US ambassador to uh, Ukraine, Jeffrey Pyatt, uh, the one in which the two of them, Newland and Pyatt, basically agreed on the membership of the post-Yanukovych Ukrainian government, this before uh, Yanukovych had yet been overthrown. And it was notable that over the course of that discussion, they each agreed with each other that Klitschko should not really be given any significant role. So when the um, events, the seizure of power, I'm careful in my choice of words, took place, um, Klitschko was parked in the important post of mayor of Kiev, which he has occupied ever since. But of course, he's been kept well away from the presidency and the government and all of those things. And anyway, he's now, it seems, reasserting himself. I'm not sure what political ambitions he has, but anyway, he's clearly coming back and he's now becoming increasingly critical, publicly critical of Zelensky. And I'm now getting some reports, by the way, that the telephone conversation, the hacked telephone conversation between Poroshenko and um, Akhmetov might actually be, might actually have been a real conversation. Um, I'm still not fully convinced about this, and I know quite a few people are doubtful. But to reiterate again, Poroshenko was a major power figure, blood broker behind the Maidan events in 2013 and 2014. Um, he then became president of Ukraine in 2014. He was the person who built up the military in 2014. And he clearly wants or expects to find he, his way back in some manner. And if, and it's a big if, this discussion between uh, Poroshenko, who is, of course, as well as being a, a political leader, a former oligarch in Ukraine. And Akhmetov, who was at one time Ukraine's leading oligarch, but much of whose wealth and assets has now, um, has now uh, been lost because it was located in territory which is now under Russian control. Anyway, 
Poroshenko and Akhmetov together. Apparently, if this correct discussion is true, they both also agree that the situation is dire. Poroshenko said that the situation, the time is running out. He said that the military are backing whatever it is exactly that he's planning to do in Kiev and um, that he's clearly working. It became quite clear to me that he was clearly working to oust Poroshenko, uh, uh, um, to, to oust Zelensky in some way. Now, just for the record, if that is a real conversation, then I suspect that um, it's the Russians who were probably listening in and who have presumably published this um, recording of it. But anyway, that's Poroshenko and Akhmetov. Now, all of this is going on. All of these power games in Kiev, signs of despair in the West, Stoltenberg's comments going further perhaps than I've seen up to now from any Western official, admitting that the situation is now becoming increasingly grave, but no sign of any real strategy. And we've had that report, which I discussed yesterday in my programme, from Seymour Hirsch about the negotiations which were taking place between the Russians, supposedly taking place between the Russians and the Ukrainians, between the Russian chief of the general staff and commander of the Russian forces fighting in the special military operation and Zeluzhny, um, and, and sorry, in, in Ukraine rather, and um, Zeluzhny, supposed Gerasimov Zeluzhny discussions. I made absolutely clear yesterday that in my opinion, no such discussions are taking place. And I've had a number of sources today essentially tell me the same thing. And I've had one source in particular who has been consistently reliable about these matters, um, though I should stress this is a person who is not in either Russia or Ukraine, but is in a third country, but who does have extensive contacts in Russia. Anyway, he's contacted me, and he has in fact said that it's absolutely correct. There are no discussions such as the ones that Hirsch described taking place between Gerasimov and Zeluzhny. In fact, as I discussed yesterday, discussions of that nature are, I mean, make absolutely no sense whatsoever. But he did say that informal discussions between Ukraine, Ukrainian, Ukrainians and, uh, uh, and between the Ukrainians and the Russians are indeed taking place. I got the impression that this person obtained this information through contacts with aides of Russian MPs in the Duma. That's, to a certain extent, my own under, you know, understanding of his words. He didn't actually quite say that. And I also got the impression, which again goes beyond what he actually said, that most of these discussions are taking place in third countries and that the discussions are not being conducted by actual officials of either the Russian or Ukrainian governments, but they are be being conducted informally by various um, intermediaries, by various business people and ex-diplomats and people of that kind. And essentially, the purpose of these discussions, these informal discussions, is to see whether some way can be found to get negotiations going. And again, it's clear that the initiative for these discussions on the Russian side 
is coming from the Russian government, but that on the Ukrainian side, Zelensky and the team around him are in opposition. They are hostile to these discussions and that the Ukrainians who are engaging in these discussions are having to do workarounds. Anyway, the essential Russian position which has been communicated to these Ukrainian intermediaries is very clear and it is consistent with everything that we have been hearing from um, the Russians, what the Russians have been saying publicly, but it's, as I said, very clear and basically Ukraine cannot join NATO. That is an absolute red line. There is no possibility of Ukraine joining NATO under any circumstances. And if they try to do that, if there is, for example, a decision that Ukraine should, what's left of Ukraine should join NATO, even whilst the fighting continues to be underway, the Russians will ignore that and will press on and will continue the military operation and will dare the other NATO states, the United States and the others, to intervene on Russia's behalf. And apparently the Russians have explained some of the reasons for their hard line. They've invested by now um, a large amount in this war. They've lost men in their tens of thousands. Nobody disputes this. Um, if we take the media zona uh, figures, they have already established that at least 37,000 Russian soldiers have died over the course of this war. Um, the Russians also um, consider that they've had to pay an economic price for the war. The Russian economy is surging at the moment. That surge might not continue indefinitely. That is well understood. But it may be surging at the moment, but it does. it is nonetheless the case that they've lost their um, economic, former economic links to Europe and to the United States. And ultimately, and beyond this, there is, there is the overriding question of security for the Russians. Any idea of Ukraine entering NATO in any form is unacceptable because the Russians, and this is now the settled view right across the entire Russian political and military elite, the Russians see NATO, NATO membership for Ukraine as an existential danger. So that makes entirely complete sense to me. I suspect that informal contacts like this, of the kind that have been spoken about by this source have probably been underway all along. I suspect there's never been a point in the war when some Ukrainians haven't been talking to some Russians in pri privately in private discussions. But certainly nothing like the Gerasimov um, Zaluzhny discussions that Seymour Hirsch spoke about, nothing like that is really underway. Now, this, or, this source has also provided some um, comments about the tactical arguments, the, the disagreements between Zelensky and Zaluzhny about how the military campaign ought to have been conducted. Um, I'm going to discuss those some other day. They are about military developments, military, uh, rather military thinking. They are now historic, but it is interesting to see that Zaluzhny did have, 
at least some ideas about how the battles in Bakhmut and the summer operation uh, offensive should be conducted, which differed from Zelensky's. And it's interesting that, again, it was Zelensky's ideas which apparently prevailed instead. But anyway, there we go. I, I'm going to discuss that, as I said, some other day. So, gathering gloom, um, utterly intractable line from the Russians. They're not prepared to budge from any of the demands that they have made. They, on the contrary, feel that the wind is in their sails. They see no reason to um, moderate their demands now, given that the war is going the way they want it to. They are increasingly confident of victory and NATO membership for Ukraine, something which supposedly Gerasimov had conceded, Gerasimov and Putin had conceded to Zeluzhny, that is and remains completely unacceptable to the Russians. Some people, by the way, I've noticed some threads have said that I've devoted too much time to debunking the um, Zeluzhny um, Gerasimov discussions. Um, I am not going to, I don't agree with that. The story about these discussions has spread and they've been talked about in many places. I think it's only appropriate if I explain why they cannot be taking place in the way that they have been. So, that's where we are. Growing despair in the West, even Stoltenberg. Well, he's not giving up, obviously. On the contrary, he wants Ukraine to go on fighting to the very end. As I said, the um, moves to get Ukraine into NATO that are, that are now underway are intended by Stoltenberg and people like him to make future negotiations between the Ukrainians and the Russians impossible. In, they're intended to prevent negotiations. But there we are. That is where we are. That is where we stand. We are in a situation where, as we will see shortly, the Russians continue to push forward to make advances on the battle lines, on every front line now. And there is no political strategy in the West. There is instead accumulating despair about where this particular project, the Ukraine project, is going. Now, that brings me back to the topic of the negotiations, the actual negotiations which did take place in February and March last year. Now, um, over the last um, couple of days, I've been reading an article by Edward Druce, who was a former Downing Street advisor in Boris Johnson's cabinet. He left, I should say, he left Downing Street in 2021. Um, I think this was connected in some ways to the various changeovers that took place, changes, changeovers in personnel, which took place following the departure from the British government of Boris Johnson's chief aide and advisor at that time, Dominic Cummings. But anyway, I'm not familiar with that. I don't want to go into the details. But anyway, Edward Druce was a former advisor to Boris Johnson, to the British government. He was there in Downing Street. He met all of these people. He met Boris Johnson many times, obviously. He presumably would have met Liz Truss and other members of the cabinet. He was there at the heart of the government machine. He was there before the war began. He was not familiar, therefore, he's not personally directly familiar with the negotiations that took place in February and March of this year, uh, of 2022, rather. And he is not, obviously, he played no role at all in 
the decisions that were taken in February and March 2022 to basically bring those negotiations to a stop, to go back on the draft agreement that the Russians and the Ukrainians had almost, well, had reached in Istanbul, a decision to go back on that agreement, which we know Boris Johnson and the British government played a key role in bringing about. Now, Edward Roos has done a very good program providing a detailed timeline about um, the um, negotiations themselves. You can find a video that he has done on YouTube on this very topic. Topic. I should say that this video predates the Kuyat Schulenberg report, which has appeared in Germany. Um, it's in some ways actually more detailed in the timeline it provides than the Kuyat Schulenberg report is. And of course, it's also made from a British perspective. But Drews has made a point, a further point, in an article which he has written in Substack, which I think is actually very important and which no one else has made and which needs to be made now. Because Clearly, there is some kind of effort underway to try and get some kind of negotiation process started. We've, whatever one's views about the Gerasimov um, Zaluzhny talks, they may be entirely fictitious, but somebody seems to be keen to plant the idea that there should be negotiations. We've had others talk about this. We had that Newsweek article about two weeks ago about the Americans pressing Ukraine to begin negotiations, pressing uh, Zelensky to begin negotiations. We had a further article some days ago in the London Times saying that Germany and the United States have made a joint decision to restrict weapons deliveries to Ukraine in order to get uh, the Ukrainians to agree to negotiate with the Russians. We've had Richard Haas talking about the need for negotiations. Um, we've had, well, the, I think, reliable reports about these informal discussions which are taking place between the Russians and the Ukrainians at the present time, in which the Russians have been setting out their strong terms, which I discussed earlier in this programme. Now, all of these attempts to restart negotiations are essentially an attempt to take us back to something like the agreement that was almost agreed by the Ukrainians and the Russians back in March and April 2022. Um, there is no real, and there's still some aspects of that agreement with which one senses that Western leaders would be, are unhappy. But basically, I think that a year and a half later, if they could find some way of ending this war with some kind of an agreement that is close to the outline of what was agreed by the Russians and the Ukrainians in March, April 2022, some of them at least, maybe not Stoltenberg, but some of them would breathe a sigh of relief. Well, given that that is so, one might assume, one would assume, that the topic of those negotiations would be something that would be discussed extensively in the Western media in general, and in the British media in particular, given the 
situation we have now and given Britain's central role, its critical role in preventing those negotiations last year bearing fruit. And Edward Roos makes the entirely correct point that there is total silence about the negotiations, uh, any discussion, any mention of those negotiations in any part of the British media at the moment. I read pretty much all the uh, British printed media, not the tabloids, but all the big, uh, big uh, newspapers, the Times, the Independent, the Financial Times, all the rest, the Guardian. Um, I read The Economist. Um, I look at the BBC. Reuters, it's a wall of silence about those negotiations. Nobody talks about them. And Edward Roos has apparently, well, his video is based on an article he apparently wrote. And remember, he's a former Downing Street advisor, so somebody who is, you know, carries, one would have thought, some authority in British government circles. Anyway, he's written an article about the negotiations. He's provided a timeline. He's discussed Britain's role. And he's been trying, apparently, to get the British media to publish it. And the British um, media have uniformly, without exception, refused to do so. Not one of them. No outlet, no media outlet has agreed. Um, it is as if there is some kind of omerta on this topic. Nobody wants to talk about what happened in February, March, April last year, insofar as the negotiations are concerned. If you go back and read old copies of the Financial Times, from that period, you will find many references then to the negotiations. You will find no mention of the negotiations anywhere in the British media today. And this is astonishing, and it is extremely troubling. It means that it is going to be extremely difficult for uh, the British government to <laughs> rethink its political strategies over the course of the, about the conflict in Ukraine. I'm going to suggest that it tells us something else, which is that the British politically, the British government collectively, is extremely nervous about what happened last year. As I've said many times, in many programs, the role that Britain has played during this conflict in Ukraine leaves Britain potentially severely exposed to criticism from its Western partners if it turns out that things went wrong. The role Boris Johnson played in sabotaging the negotiations in March, April 2022, open up the possibility that Britain, unfairly in my opinion, will be blamed and will become the scapegoat for the fact that those negotiations weren't allowed to bear fruit at that time. Now, Drews does make, he doesn't make that point, that is my point, but he does make a further point, which is that closing down all discussion of this subject is, of course, consistent with the way in which the media in Britain has been covering the Ukraine war entirely. He makes a point that the media in Britain, for example, was hugely optimistic, united in its optimism, about Ukraine's summer offensive. He makes the further point that um, those persons, 
myself, I suppose, but lots of others, more eminent than me, who predicted that the offensive would be a failure, um, have been proved right. Um, the narrative that is now universal across the British media is that the war is in a stalemate situation. Um, the same people, myself for example, um, who um, predicted the failure of the Ukrainian offensive, but who said that the war is not in a stalemate situation, um, are now saying are now saying that, that the war that Ukraine is actually losing the war. But apart from one sort of admission in the Economist that Putin might actually be winning the war, you don't really see much discussion of the true trajectory of the war in the media in Britain either. And in fact, I may as well say that to a great extent now, to a very great extent now, discussion of the Ukraine war has disappeared from the front pages of the big newspapers here. Well, this is, to put it mildly unsatisfactory, I hope this changes. I hope people heed what Edward Druce has written. I apologise to those of you who are not British, because I have devoted time to this, but I am British and I am concerned for my own country and I think, as Edward Roos correctly says, that an open and frank discussion about what is, both about what happened and about what is going wrong um, now in Britain is urgently needed and this omerta that we're seeing instead today is disastrous it has led us to a potentially dangerous position that we are now in and we have to end it and start facing the facts and talking about them openly if we are to avoid things continuing to go even more wrong. Anyway, that's all I'm going to say about this. Now, Turning to the actual situation in the war, every day now the situation becomes bleaker for Ukraine. It's now absolutely clear to me that the bridgehead, the Ukrainian bridgehead in Klinky, and by the way, this area that the Ukrainians are in, broke through in <laughs> uh, between Verbovoye and Rabotino, that these areas are now essentially fire sacks. The Russians um, use them to lure more and more Ukrainian troops in and they launch uh, artillery and missile strikes and drone strikes on the Ukrainian soldiers there. Um, casualties are high and if we're talking about Kherson region, given that the forces that have been deployed there are relatively small compared with what you find elsewhere in the war, elsewhere on the front lines. The Krinky fire stack is fulfilling for the Russians the useful purpose of weakening Ukrainian troops, reducing, a, inflicting attrition on the Ukrainian troops in Kherson, which is probably precisely what the Russians want to do. And, of course, a couple of days ago, Vladimir Sladko, the governor of the Russian-controlled area of Kherson region on the east bank of the Dnieper, he said that he'd had discussions with Putin, that Putin confirmed to him that it is the Russian intention to regain control of Dnieper, of the of Herson region on the east bank of the Dnieper, including Herson City, and we can see how the crinky the crinky fire sack works to that purpose because the Ukrainian troops that are being attritioned 
are precisely the Ukrainian troops who the Russians would otherwise have to fight when eventually they do decide to pursue the offensive in Kherson region, when they do decide to recross themselves the Dnieper River to reoccupy the territories they withdrew from last year on the East Bank. Anyway, that's what I'll say about those two zones. Now, in Avdevka, the situation every day for Ukraine becomes worse. It's not a case of dramatic Russian ad advances, but the Russian advances are taking place. They're happening every day. And given that we're talking about a siege, they're actually, in my opinion, moving forward quite fast. Uh, I've seen the latest maps that various people have been producing. I'm not a great person with maps, but it does seem that uh, the uh, defence zones, the Ukrainian defence zones, in south west and south east uh, of Devka are collapsing, that the Russians are advancing surprisingly fast in these territories, that the SOC, in other words, is shrinking. The SOC, the area around Avdevka, is shrinking. But perhaps the most fierce fighting is not actually taking place in that particular location. It's happening to the northwest in the area of uh, Stepovoye. By the way, I'm seeing, I, I now realize there are actually slightly different variants for the spelling of this particular village. And um, of course the Russians call it by an entirely different name, which again is confusing. But there is, appears to be enormously fierce fighting going on um, in and around this village between whatever Russian military formations are concentrated here and the 47th Mechanized Brigade of the Ukrainian military, the one with the Bradleys and the Leopard 2s. The Ukrainians are throwing everything they have into trying to stem the Russian advance west of the railway track. The latest reports appear to confirm that the Russians still have at the very least a presence in Stepovoye, or perhaps even outright control of this village. But the Ukrainians appear to be contesting that control. And the fighting in this area appears to be incredibly fierce. However, and suffice to say, that despite this desperate Ukrainian resistance, in Stepovoye Berdichi, it's clear that the Russians are gradually expanding their bridgehead, if I can call it that, west of the railway. They appear to be uh, gradually expanding, uh, gaining ground south and north of Stepovoye, as well as the village itself. They're gradually con gaining control of the uh, of driving Ukrainian troops out of trench lines that have been created there and um, forest plantations. And despite this intense Ukrainian resistance, it seems now only a question of time. Well, it is clearly only a question of time before Ukrainian resistance here collapses. Stepovoye falls entirely under Russian control, um, uncontested Russian control, and the Russians are able to push further um, towards Berdichi itself. And um, it's, I think, generally acknowledged that if the Russians capture Berdichi, then in effect, the Ukrainian troops in Avdevka are in a desperate position so we could see that within the, deep down inside the sack, 
The Russians continue to push forward. They apparently have most of the roads around Avdeevka. They can shell uh, Ukrainian um, troops and vehicles that are trying to move up and down these roads. Um, that must mean, by the way, that supplies must be getting increasingly short for the Ukrainians in Avdeevka. Presumably they've stockpiled quite a few, but anyway, the um, Ukrainian defence lines there um, do appear to be um, crumbling within Avdeevka itself, though slowly and incrementally it's clear that the Ukrainian forces, the 110th Brigade, are still putting up a lot of resistance. But the big battle in Avdeevka is still raging around this village of Stepovoye, and the Russians are pushing forward steadily, making advances. They're obviously suffering losses, but clearly the Ukrainian troops, the 47th Brigade, are suffering losses too. And elsewhere, it's the same story. The Russians apparently are now one hill away from moving back and reoccupying Staromayorsk on the Remivka salient, and Staromayorsk and then Urozhanye, if they're recaptured, that will effectively mean the negation of all Ukrainian progress in the Vremevka salient in the August, in the, in the July and August fighting. And even more seriously for the Ukrainians, it seems that um, the Russians are now making very more, very significant advances um, around Bakhmut, that they're clearing the Ukrainians from the tree lines. They are obviously in secure control of Khromovo. They've sent reconnaissance troops into uh, Bogdanovka, but they haven't apparently yet made a serious attempt to capture Bogdanovka. That has now been clarified. But they're getting ever closer to the position where they can, in fact, launch an outright offensive against Bogdanovka. And as I said, once Bogdanovka is captured, then in terms of Bakhmut at least, the Battle of Bakhmut is finally over. The Russians will have secured unchallengeable control of that town and of the villages around it. And I've seen further reports which suggest that the next moves that the Russians will take once Bogdanovka is captured um, and once the Ukrainians have been pushed away from Ivanivska, where the Russians apparently are already also making progress, is that they will press on towards Chasov Yar, presumably capture Chasov Yar itself. A Ukrainian soldier last year, or early this year, said it was undefendable. And once they've captured Chasov Yar, they will then reach a canal, a water barrier, and the assumption for the moment is that the Russians will then stop at that water barrier and will consolidate before they make any decision to advance further west. So that seems to be the tactic there. And there's also been lots of reports from the area of Liman, um, Krasny Liman as it, the Russians refer to it. The Russians captured Liman in May of last year. The Ukrainians recaptured it in, I think it was October um, of last year. Um, the Russians have been making significant progress in this area too. But as always, their major priority seems to be to inflict as much attrition on the Ukrainian troops as possible. Now, I've had another... This is a completely different member of the Duran community. He has written to me. He discussed in a very interesting and intelligent way and historically well-informed way. This is a person who has served in Western militaries and 
obviously had a role in analysis. Anyway, this person uh, has explained to me the role of the heavy artillery brigades in the Soviet military, the ones that were equipped with the 203 millimeter howitzers and the 240 millimeter mortars, the ones that the Russians are now intent on recreating. From what I could tell, he suggested that these were assigned to um, strategic reserves and were deployed in order to create a particular punch, an artillery punch, in one specific location. And he also said that the Soviet military also had specific artillery divisions, which um, did not use 203 and 240 millimeter um, artillery, but 152 millimeter artillery. And it was the, this artillery, these divisions, that um, were deployed with the frontline troops and provided the artillery support for those troops. So the brigades with the heavier guns would be deployed in weak positions on the lines to support Russian offensives. And the artillery brigades with the um, 152 millimeter artillery would play a, 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 a more, um, shall we say, general role in the fighting. At least this is the extent to which I understood, understand this. And this person suggested that if the Russians are indeed intent on recreating their brigades, their heavy artillery brigades, and are intent on concentrating their 203 millimeter artillery in that kind of way, then that suggests that they do actually have large amounts of 203 millimeter artillery so that they can afford to recreate the brigades in that way. Well, I think that might be true, but there is something else which is in the process of happening in uh, military terms, which is that the Russians are also, according to some reports, in the process of um, deploying new, longer-ranged 152 millimeter artillery. Apparently the coalition tracked vehicle, and I believe it's called the Malka, um, self-propelled wheeled vehicle, rather like the Caesar, the French Caesar wheeled vehicle, are also starting down to appear on the battle lines. They have at least comparable range to Western artillery systems, 155 millimeter artillery systems. Anyway, they're also being deployed too. So that might explain why the Russians now feel able to recreate these brigades. Anyway, this is all very technical, but the overall thing, the overall point is that the Russian military continues to evolve and increase and strengthen. They've got vast numbers of drones now. They massively outnumber the, Rus the Ukrainians in drones. They have a very powerful air force. Ukraine's air force continues to suffer extremely heavy losses. I neglected to mention yesterday, by the way, when I went through the Russian Defense Ministry's intelligence briefing for the Ukrainian losses over the last week, that over that previous week, the week ending 2nd December, Ukraine apparently lost five, seven jet fighters, including uh, five MiG-29s and two Sukhoi 27s. So the Russian Air Force remains incredibly strong, increasingly powerful, and the Russian military continues to evolve. And in the meantime, Stoltenberg talks about the problems of the fragmentation of the European defence industry. He doesn't seem to have, as I said, any kind of plan as to how things can be reversed. And of course, the battle goes on. Um, 
My own view is that sometime in the winter, we will obviously see Avdeevka fall. There's reports, there continue to be reports, by the way, that the Ukrainians are now withdrawing their remaining forces, the remaining stragglers they have, from Marinka, which, about which there was a lot discussed yesterday. So Marinka probably about to be fully occupied by the Russians. Abdevka is likely to fall. Probably over the course of the winter, we will see the Russians move on to places like Chasov Yar, and conceivably um, Kupiansk as well. And I suspect there will then be an operational pause, and then the Russians will advance again and will continue their attrition war. The same person who spoke to me about um, the nature of Russia's artillery organization expressed the opinion that, for the moment, the Russians will continue their policy of attrition until finally the Ukrainian military begins to lose cohesion. And he thinks that might still be some way off, but it's clear that inexorably we are moving in that direction. And even people like Stoltenberg now have begun to understand it. Anyway, that's my summary about the state of the war in Ukraine at the moment. Now, the other conflict in Gaza rages away unabated. And we've had some comments now about it from Lloyd Austin, and they're appearing in the Financial Times, which, as I've said many times, is a uh, media outlet which is in some ways very close to the US government, to the uh, Biden administration. Anyway, the article is headlined, US warns that Israel risks strategic defeat unless it protects civilians in Gaza. And this all de derives from certain comments that US Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin has made. And the Financial Times goes on to say this. Look, uh, Lloyd Austin has warned Israel that it risks strategic defeat unless it protects Palestinian civilians in Gaza. In a sign of growing tensions between the close allies as Israel resumes its military campaign in southern Gaza, Austin said Israel would only win if it protected civilians and created humanitarian corridors. In this kind of fight, the center of gravity is the civilian population. And if you drive them into the arms of the enemy, you replace a tactical village victory with a strategic defeat. And um, the article then goes on to say, that American officials have uh, stressed to Israel that they must avoid the kind of mass internal displacement triggered by the bombardment in northern Gaza. Uh, they have urged Israel to be more precise in the next phase of its campaign. They have told Israel that it must um, learn the lessons that the US learnt in its war in Iraq and not allow um, an entity like the um, Islamic State to emerge. We've had more quotes from um, Austin. Like Hamas, ISIS was deeply embedded in urban areas and the international community coalition against ISIS worked hard to protect civilians and create humanitarian corridors even during the toughest battles by humanitarian corridors. What I think Austin is talking about is that he mean he means um, sanctuary areas within Gaza itself. Biden has given undertakings to Arab leaders that there is not to, there will not be displacement of the population from Gaza, and 
Anyway, Austin is then quoted finally as saying, the lesson is not that you can win in urban area warfare by protecting civilians. The lesson is that you can only win in urban warfare by protecting civilians. Now, all of this may be true. There's no sign that I can see that the Netanyahu cabinet is paying much or indeed any attention to this. And there's no sign either that the United States is exerting any real pressure at the moment on Israel to ensure that they heed these types of warnings. And I'm going to speak for myself here and say that I don't actually understand, I don't see a way whereby Israel can achieve even the tactical victory that Lloyd Austin is talking about, um, which does not risk the uh, large numbers of civilian deaths that Lloyd Austin says would result in a strategic defeat. And once again, we see the internal contradictions within the Biden administration. On the one hand, they appear to be aware of the growing political storm that the events in Gaza is stirring up, both within the United States and in the Middle East. And at the same time, they did seem to have an ability to shape events on the ground in a way that might actually prevent that storm taking place. Lloyd Austin talks about Israel winning a tactical victory, but risking a strategic defeat. I think it is important for people in Washington to understand that a strategic defeat for Israel translates across the Middle East into a strategic defeat for the United States. Um, as far as the Middle East is concerned, opinion in the Middle East, opinion in Europe as well, by the way, to a great extent, Israel and the United States are, bound, are now bound at the hip. That was what President Biden ensured when he went to Israel in October and embraced Prime Minister Netanyahu. So the failure of the one automatically now translates into the failure of the other. If the Americans really do want to prevent a strategic defeat, not just for Israel, but ultimately for themselves, then they need to change their policy fast and they need not just to give these words of advice to the Israelis, but to take steps to ensure that the Israelis heed them. Now, can I say, sooner or later, that is exactly what I suspect the United States is going to do. The Israelis didn't want the humanitarian pause that we had over the course of last week, or at least when I say the Israelis, I mean by that Prime Minister Netanyahu and his cabinet, they were pushed into doing it, as has been widely conceded in Israel itself, under intense American pressure. Sooner or later, that intense American pressure is going to start all over again. We're going to see more humanitarian pauses. But it seems to me that the sooner the United States itself starts to formulate an approach to this conflict that embraces a ceasefire in Gaza, but looks for some political way forward, the better it will be. At the moment,
the administration is purely reacting to events. It's allowing the Arab states and the BRIC states to lead the diplomacy, including in the United Nations, and it's allowing Prime Minister Netanyahu and his cabinet to dictate events on the ground. The, if you follow the logic of what Lloyd Austin is saying, the Americans need to try to get ahead of the situation rather than to follow behind in the wake of the others. Now, there's an awful lot more that can be said about this. There's more that can be said about the humanitarian disaster that is taking place in Gaza. There's more that can be said about the evolution of Israeli politics. These are such enormous topics that um, I think that they require much more time than I have today. And I'm thinking that perhaps a discussion about this, a specific di discussion about this whole issue, may be on our locals platform, bringing together people and seeing what people have to say about it, uh, that that might be the way to do, to address this, to address this, these, these other big topics about the war. I, I recognize, and by the way, to a very great extent, share the feelings many people have about this uh, war, this conflict in Gaza. But today, what I did want to highlight is, again, the reactive, I would say actually weak response of the Biden administration to events, its inability for the moment to come up with a plan and the enormous risks in an indirect way now confirmed by Lloyd Austin that this passive response um, runs. Anyway, this is my programme for today. More from me soon. Um, let me remind you again that you can find all our, um, all our programmes on our various platforms, on Locals, Rumble and X. You can find, uh, you can also uh, support our work if you wish via Patreon and Subscribestar. Links under this video. Don't forget also to check out our uh, uh, shop where you can find all sorts of amazing things. Our magic mugs, our hats, our hoodies, our t-shirts and th um, things like that. And last but not least, please remember to, uh, if you've liked this video, to tick the like button and to check your subscription to this, to this uh, channel. Thank you uh, once more. More from me soon. Have a very good day.